Evolutionists like to talk about how intelligent design is anti-science. Ken Miller, Brown University, once said that intelligent design is a science stopper. Kevin Padian, University of California, Berkeley, said that it makes people stupid. In other words, they believe that intelligent design is something like this. It's a science stopper. But in the last video, we saw how, in the case of junk DNA, it was actually evolution that was stopping science and discouraging research. Intelligent design, on the other hand, not only encouraged research, but made predictions that turned out to be correct. Do you remember when leading scientific journals said that ENCODE sounded the, quote, death knell for junk DNA? ENCODE scientists didn't come at their work with an agenda against evolution. They just wanted to understand what was going on in the cell. Everyone recognized the powerful evidence that ENCODE provided. So how did evolutionists react? Some had legitimate questions. Hmm. Some tried to rewrite history. Others got angry and tried to deny the data to salvage their beloved theory. They still to this day claim it's junk. Even in light of all the evidence from ENCODE and elsewhere showing that junk DNA has function. Let's take a look. Many people have not been happy about ENCODE's findings. Developmental biologist P.Z. Myers claimed the ENCODE researchers are fundamentally dishonest and that they didn't have a clue about biology. Bioinformatician Nick Madsky claimed that ENCODE researchers lacked broad training in basic comparative biology, in other words, evolution. Biochemist Lawrence Moran flatly called the ENCODE scientists Stupid. Dan Grauer made a presentation that said he wanted to kill in code, complete with bullet holes and blood. Talk about angry. Even leading journals like Science and Nature recognize the anger, rudeness, intemperate griping, and vitriolic hyperbole levied by ENCODE's critics. Some evolution defenders go the opposite route. Instead of denying ENCODE's data, they embrace ENCODE, but then try to rewrite history and claim that evolutionary biologists predicted function for junk DNA all along. Richard Dawkins is a great example of this. Before ENCODE, he was quite confident in junk DNA. Remember what he said? In 2012, after ENCODE came out, he stated that function for junk DNA wasn't awkward for Darwinism. Quite the contrary, of course. It is exactly what a Darwinist would hope for, to find usefulness in the living world. Whether or not he predicted that all along, you be the judge. That said, there were some legitimate questions raised. Some scientists pointed to the lowly onion. If you didn't know, onions are delicious on tacos, and onions have huge genomes. Many billions of base pairs in size, five times the size of the human genome, in fact. Surely that entire gigantic genome can't all be functional, they say with incredulity. Actually, plants, such as onions, are often known to have a condition called polyploidy, where they can inherit extra sets of chromosomes. This can lead to the large genome size. Also, there's a positive correlation between genome size and cell volume, hinting at structural reasons for all that DNA. If you've ever looked at onion cells under a microscope in biology class, you know that onion cells can be very large, so it makes sense that they might have a lot of DNA for structural reasons. Many evolutionists cite things called pseudogenes and ERVs as proof of evolution in junk DNA. Pseudogenes are sections of DNA that look like functional genes, but are thought to have a mutation that stops them from working. In other words, they're junk. But even if that was the case, Pseudogenes wouldn't necessarily refute intelligent design any more than a rusty, broken down car refutes Ford. No one thinks the broken state of a thing proves it wasn't originally designed. But it turns out many pseudogenes aren't like rusty, broken cars. They're actually functional and they work just like they're supposed to. Kind of like a turn signal. They work, people just don't use them. Pseudogenes can be normal regulatory elements of our genome, which are designed to look like protein coding genes because of how they need to function. Evolutionary scientists totally missed this key function for pseudogenes. This paper cautioned that pseudogene function is prematurely dismissed due to dogma. Here's a famous example. Brown University biologist and ID critic Kenneth Miller testified in a court trial that the human beta globin pseudogene is broken because it has molecular errors that render the gene non-functional, indicating humans share a common ancestor with apes. Two years later, leading evolution advocate Eugenie Scott claimed this pseudogene 
isn't going to do diddly. It's just going to sit there and not do a thing. But in 2013, a study proved them both wrong. This pseudogene is functional after all, and a 2021 study actually found that it is essential and has indispensability for human red blood cell formation. The reality is that just like other claims of junk DNA, this one falls apart since pseudogenes do have important functions like these papers detail. Well, what about ERVs? Endogenous retroviruses are another class of junk DNA, commonly cited in favor of evolution. These are claimed to be ancient viruses that infected some common ancestor of both apes and humans because now they're found in exactly the same spot of DNA in both. And as the argument goes, the likelihood of these viruses being inserted by chance into the same place in the genomes of different species is very low. So common descent is the better explanation. Intelligent design scientists agree they didn't arise by chance. That'd be silly. Like plagiarism, if two students have the exact same set of words in a section of their papers, the chances of those words being put together in that particular order independently or by chance are so low that an outside observer can rightfully suspect common ancestry or plagiarism. The two students copied from a common source. But the argument for plagiarism falls apart if, say, the teacher had structured the assignment to require the insertion of a certain quote into the opening paragraphs of each student's paper. Then there's a reasonable explanation why those words appear at the beginning of both papers. The insertion of the duplicate language is neither chance nor plagiarism, but a result of the way the assignment was intelligently designed by the teacher. Likewise, the argument for common ancestry falls apart if the ERVs aren't randomly inserted. If these ERVs prefer certain spots in the DNA, that could explain the similarities without appealing to chance or common descent. Even more important than that though, ERVs show widespread evidence of function. They're not all simply dead ancient viruses, though some may be. They have important roles, particularly with gene regulation, developmental functions, and they're even involved in immune-related functions to repel viral infections. In fact, many ERVs may look like viral DNA because they have functions related to fighting viral infections. This is important. If the DNA is functional, then it provides no special evidence for common ancestry. Even junk DNA proponent Francis Collins admits, similarity alone does not, of course, prove a common ancestor because a designer could have used successful design principles over and over again. In other words, shared functional DNA could be well explained by common design. In attempts to salvage their beloved junk DNA argument, some have shifted the goalpost from junk DNA to junk RNA, or even junk proteins. But these claims have the same problems as the claims of junk DNA. We keep finding function in areas we previously were not aware of. Other scientists appeal to blatantly circular arguments. For example, consider yourself compared to say, this mouse. Both of you have DNA, so far so good. And much of that DNA is the same. This makes sense because both of you are mammals, so you'd expect to share certain traits with each other. Other parts of your DNA, however, are different. This also makes sense because, well, different things are different. But to some evolutionists, those differences are proof that junk DNA exists, regardless of what ENCODE or others have to say. How does that work? According to evolutionary theory, all living things are descended from a single common ancestor. This means that at one point, all living things trace back to the exact same DNA. Under this theory, the differences between species today only exist because of mutations that have built up in the gene pools over time. There's a problem though. Mutations are dangerous. Changing any part of a functional genome is far more likely to harm or kill an organism than it is to help it. Kind of like driving a car down the road. If you're currently using the tires, it's hard to change them. But if the mutated genes are non-functional, if they're not currently in use, maybe like a spare tire, they could be tinkered with more safely. So the argument goes like this. You and this mouse are different because of accumulated mutations. Those mutations will most easily accumulate in non-functional regions. So evolution predicts that these different regions must be junk DNA. A 2014 paper used this reasoning to claim that only 8.2% of human DNA is functional, because that's the amount of DNA that's similar between humans and other mammals. But do you see the problem? If only the common bits of DNA are functional, 
why would a mouse be a mouse and not you? So some of this junk DNA has to be functional, torpedoing their entire logic. And on top of that, the first point in this argument, we're different only because of accumulated mutations, is an assumption. Scientists don't know that all genetic differences come from mutations. They assume that at the outset because their evolutionary viewpoint tells them to. But what if, and I know this might sound crazy, but hear me out, what if the differences in DNA are what help make us different from mice? Intelligent design not only predicts that this different DNA is likely functional, it predicts that this different DNA might be what encodes the differences between species. And as we learn more about junk DNA, this indeed seems to be the case. This elegantly explains the reason for many similarities and differences in DNA between different species. The similarities reflect basic proteins that are needed in different types of species. And the differences in DNA control the unique things about an organism. In biology, similarities between species are important, but it's the differences that make the difference. By assuming that much of the DNA that's different between species was junk, evolutionists missed out on crucial scientific data. Others rely on a junk of the gaps argument, claiming that until we find function in a gene, we should assume it's junk. But this argument is defeated by the trend line of the data. We're finding function practically everywhere we look. Regardless, they have faith that maybe the next gene right around the corner will be junk this time. Like many others, University of Houston biologist Dan Grauer realized that a lot was riding on junk DNA. He too understood that you can tell a lot about a theory by the predictions it makes. He said this, If the human genome is indeed devoid of junk DNA as implied by the ENCODE project, then a long, undirected evolutionary process cannot explain the human genome. If, on the other hand, organisms are designed, then all DNA, or as much as possible, is expected to exhibit function. If ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. In regard to DNA, ID would help science progress faster. Evolutionists wanted us to ignore junk DNA. There's nothing there. ID said, look into it. It's important. Yet there are examples of mainstream scientists charging that the junk DNA mindset held back science. The term junk DNA for many years repelled mainstream researchers from studying non-coding DNA. Who would like to dig through genomic garbage? However, now more and more biologists regard repetitive elements as genomic treasure. Who is stopping science? Evolution's predictions about junk DNA were wrong, and for a long time repelled researchers from progressing science forward. ID predicted function and was proved right. Intelligent design makes better predictions than the standard evolutionary model. And in science, if a model makes successful predictions, then it's more likely that paradigm is true. If you'd like to help us make more videos like this, please consider subscribing and click the little notification bell. Share this video with your friends too. Thanks for watching.